Hi guys, welcome to the third part of the motor control class. In this part of the class we're going to be studying reach grasp and manipulation. In this lecture and the next we'll be reviewing the foundational concepts and knowledge that's useful for understanding how we're able to make reaches to grasp objects and to manipulate objects. Let's start this lecture by going back to where we started with the systems approach model of Shumway Cook and Woolacott. From this model, functional movements are seen to emerge from a context of constraints. Here we have the task, individual, and environment model, or TIE model. Functional movements emerge from the confluence of constraints that is created when a particular person is performing a particular task in a particular environment. So we can look at each of these in turn. First, we have subsystems within the individual. When I took you through the foundations of postural control and the foundations of mobility, we first looked at action, then perception, then cognition. We'll be doing the same with the foundations of mobility in th uh, through this first lecture. In the case of environmental constraints, we have regulatory features and non-regulatory features that we've talked about before. And finally, we have the attributes of the task. Here we have an image of a man running down a street, balancing a tray with a bottle balanced on top of the tray. Performing this task effectively requires manipulating the tray in order to stop the bottle from falling off of the tray. The task demands of manipulating the tray are nested within the task demands of running down the street and the task demands of m maintaining the posture of the body. From the system's approach, effective upper extremity control is going to depend upon the context of constraints provided by the task, individual, and the environment. In the specific case of reach grasp and manipulation, examples of tasks include pointing at an object, grasping an object, throwing an object, or grasping and manipulating an object. We will be looking at these different tasks in details over this lecture and the next. In the case of subsystems within the individual, relevant factors include the age of the individual, the experience that, that a particular individual has in performing that particular type of upper extremity task, and the presence or absence of a particular pathology. Lastly, we have the constraints of the environment. For the task of manipulating an object, a fundamental environment, environmental constraint is going to be the physical properties of the object that's going to be manipulated. One of the things that we're going to see when we're looking at upper, upper extremity tasks is that all of the tasks we're going to look at are going to be broken down into subtasks. When we looked at mobility, we looked at the different phases of gait. We saw that different functions were being realized within these different phases. The different phases represent different functional aspects of the task. Similarly, when we're looking at upper extremity movements, we will assume that there's distinct functional components or, dis or discrete phases to the movements. The literature has revealed evidence of distinct neurophysiological structures that are involved in, in supporting the distinct phases of upper extremity movement that we will uh, identify throughout this class. To get ourselves thinking about this, let's pick a random task and think about, uh, think about how it might be broken down into subtasks. Here we have the task of throwing a rock through a window. The first phase of this task might be to locate a target. The next phase would be to locate a throwable object. Here we see someone holding out an object, and so we're, uh, we're reaching out to grasp that object. Next is the transportation of the arm and hand towards, towards the object. And after that, we have grasping the object and manipulating the object. Next, we have the forming of a, uh, uh, forming of a grip and taking, the ho taking hold of the object in a way that's appropriate for the desired task of throwing the rock through the window. Next, we've got the transportation of the arm, hand and object through space. And then finally, we have the release of the object. Lastly, we need to remember when we're looking at this that each of these subtasks needs to be reconciled with the demands of postural control and mobility. There's a reason that we teach the class in the order that we do. We started off with posture, and as we sort of saw when we looked at anticipatory postural adjustments, posture is adapted to stabilize the body in a way that's organized around the superpostural task to be performed. 
adjustments will be made in anticipation of each of the phases that we just looked at. For example, postural, postural adjustments will be made that anticipate the perturbation to balance of taking hold of the object, and then transferring that object from one hand to another. Let's think about some of the dimensions of the task constraints involved in reach, grasp, and manipulation. Here we have a simple task. You have to pick up the hammer and hammer the peg into the hole. Here we see an image of how this task is typically performed. The hammer is grasped here in a way that supports comfortable task, a comfortable task performance posture. What you should notice here is that in order to perform the task comfortably, attention must be paid to how you should take hold of the object in order to perform the task. So you need a typical grip formation in order to end up with the comfortable task posture being produced. The simple reality of this fact can be seen when we look at the consequence of a completely legitimate, although atypical, grasp formation. If you take hold of the hammer like this, and then attempt to use it with that grip, the tool is going to feel remarkably awkward to hold, and is going to be much harder to pre precisely control the movements of the tool. We've just talked about how the form and function of an action emerges from the context of constraints. In this example, we see that the intended task of using a hammer to tap a peg, uh, to, uh, to, to tap a peg into the into, uh, into the hole, is going to fundamentally shape all parts of the action, starting with how the reach and the grasp of the hammer is organized. We can see this effect in a task that we perform each day. If you want to get a, a drink of water, you need to take hold of a cup and fill it with water. If the cup that you're picking up is facing downwards, you must turn your hand upside down in order to be able to end up with a comfortable posture for pouring water into the cup and then drinking from it. What we're seeing here, and what we saw with the hammering the peg in the hole, exa uh, hole example, is that functional grasping postures are organized with a comfortable end state posture in mind. Let's look at another aspect of the task constraints of re reaching, grasping, and manipulating objects. How the control of movement is organized is going to depend upon the goal of the task. We can compare two tasks with, di two tasks with just distinct goals, a pointing task and a reach and grasp task. In the first task, the goal is to point at something. You have the, the goal is to have the long axis of the arm being directed towards the lo a particular location in the environment. In the second task, the goal is to reach and grasp an object, to move the arm in a way that supports the hand being able to take hold of the desired object in a way that's task appropriate. In the pointing task, all arm segments are going to be controlled as a single functional unit. They're going to be controlled as a synergy, to use some language we've used before. In terms of how the task constraints are operating, they're operating to make all of the segments of the arm move as one unit. In the reaching and grasping task, research reveals that more than one synergy is implicated. The action of the hand is controlled independently of the coordinated action of the arm. What happens in this task then is that the hand carries out movements related to grasping and the arm carries out movements related to the transport of the hand towards the target. We'll be looking at some of the specifics of this type of task later today. Let's switch from talking about task constraints to talking about the constraints within the individual. What are the characteristics of the individual that contribute to the effective control of reaching, grasping and manipulation? To start off with, we have musculoskeletal constraints. This is a good place to start since it's musculoskeletal constraints that are the most frequently assessed clinically. Musculoskeletal constraints include joint range of motion, the biomechanical relationships among linked body segments, spinal flexibility, and muscle properties. So other than musculoskeletal constraints, what are the characteristics of the individual that contribute to the effective control of reaching, grasping, and manipulating objects? The individual constraints that we're going to be focus on, focusing on in the, ne in, the next in the next couple of slides are going to be neural constraints. We're going to be thinking about motor processes, sensory processes, and higher order, uh, higher level processes.
in the case of motor processes, we're going to be thinking about the coordination of eye, head and trunk movements with the movements of the arm and hand. We'll also be looking at how the distinct phases of a complex motion are coordinated. For example, when we're breaking down reaching and grasping into, 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 uh, into sub-phases of transport and grasp, we're going to look at how these different phases get coordinated. In the case of sensory processes, we'll start by looking at the major perceptual systems individually, but we'll also consider the challenge of organising visual vestibular and somatosensory information relative to each other. In terms of higher level processes, we're going to be thinking about sensorimotor coordination. That's just another way of saying the coordination of sensory and motor processes. We'll also be looking at the adaptive and anticipatory aspects of manipulatory functions. Specifically, we'll be looking at feedback control processes and feedforward control processes. We've discussed feedback and feedforward control previously, but it's been a while, so let's expand upon what we mean by these concepts. If we want to have an accurate and efficient reach, we're going to need feedforward control processes and feedback control processes to support that behavior. A feedforward control process is going to be involved in anticipating the requirements of, of the task and of the situation that the task is being performed within. For example, it's going to anticipate what obstacles are in the way, how the movement will be affected by my current posture, and how gravity will act to perturb my movement. On the right hand side of the screen we can see a waiter that's just taken a glass off of his tray and placed that glass on a table. This is a particularly rich example. We've already talked about part of the motor control challenge that exists here in our previous dis discussions of anticipatory postural adjustments. As soon as the waiter takes the glass off of the tray, he's effectively perturbing himself. He's also affecting his ability to use his other hand to manipulate the wine glass. So let's think about the feedback control process. A feedback control process is the ability to correct the effects of an unanticipated perturbation to the movement that's being produced. For example, if the waiter had not paid attention to how much wine was in the glass, or he accidentally picked, a, picked up a glass that was full rather than empty, then there would be a surprising unanticipated change in weight. Continuing our consideration of feedback versus feedback control processes, let's look at a specific example. Here we see the task of catching a ball. The specific task here is to catch the ball while keeping your arm in its initial posture when the, uh, when the ball lands in your hand. In this simple task, we have feed-forward information. You can see the ball through it falling through the air. Sight of the ball gives you information about when and how the ball is going to affect you when it impacts your hand. For example, you can visually perceive properties of the ball, such as how heavy the ball is. You can also visually perceive how fast the ball is falling, and therefore anticipate the kinds of effects that it's going to have on your hand. In this, simple in, in this simple task, we also have feedback information. The goal here, remember, is to keep the arm in its initial posture. So any deviations aw away from this initial pos uh, posture is going to be a deviation away from what was intended in the task. If we don't perfectly anticipate the consequences of the ball hitting our hand, then the arm will be perturbed away from this initial posture. Here we have some research recordings of this task. Time is on the x-axis, and the two most significant time points in this, uh, in this graph are going to be uh, are, are labeled here. We're getting the moments where the ball is being, dro uh, being dropped when it's being released, and the moment of the ball's impact with the hand. At the top of this figure, we see the time series of the elbow and wrist angles. Underneath that, we have the patterns of muscle activation for the biceps and the triceps. If you look at the muscle activation patterns leading up to the moment of the ball impacting the hand, what we see is, uh, is significant amounts of muscle recruitment. What we're seeing here in this particular part of the, the EMG time series is anticipatory muscle activations. 
I'll provide you some very rich examples of anticipatory muscle activations later in the class. For now, in simple terms, what we're seeing here is muscle forces are being organized before the impact of the ball. In other words, we're seeing planning. We're seeing, a, uh, we're seeing some kind of setting the stage for the impact in terms of the tensions that's being created in the body. In this data, we're also seeing something that we've discussed briefly before. We're seeing the signature of a short latency stretch reflex shortly after the ball's impact with the hand. Let's look in more detail at the process of feed forward or anticipatory control. The key, de key details here for understanding this process is that we have the, a ball falling through the air and that we can see the, that ball falling. Uh, the other key detail is that we have a particular muscle that can be recruited to generate the forces that are required to control the impact of the ball. We're going to walk through a simple model of feed forward control for this example. The model comes out of a branch of science called control theory and therefore we'll be using the particular technical language that's associated with control theory. From the perspective of control theory, when we're talking about visually perceiving the motion of the ball, we're talking about having a particular type of sensor that can detect ball motion. From the perspective of control theory, the output of the sensor needs to be processed. It needs to be filtered and amplified in order to cre create a signal that contains information about the, what's going on with the ball that can be fed into what's con uh, 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 that can be fed into what's referred to as a feed forward controller. In the feed forward controller, sensory input is going to be combined with memory. What we mean by this is that we're going to use both visual information about the ball and its motion together with knowledge gained from our prior experience of seeing balls flying through space or falling through space, together with prior knowledge of manipulating balls and catching balls. And we're going to use all of this knowledge to, to create a prediction of how we need to act in order to catch the ball. The idea here is that there's a mechanism in the central nervous system that takes in sensory information together with knowledge gained from experience, in order to anticipate the consequences of an unfolding event for the control of movement. The feed forward controller creates an anticipatory command. This command instructs the actions that should be performed given the anticipated consequences of the event that's currently unfolding. This anticipatory command is going to be the basis of a control signal being sent to a controller. The controller is going to organize an efferent signal to be sent to the muscles, or actuators, as they're called in the terminology of control, uh, of, uh, of control theory. What we have on this slide, then, is a description of a mechanism that allows us to compute the time of the ball's impact with the hand, and to control the timing of the arm muscles that should be activated to counteract the impact of the ball on the body. Interestingly, the, the anticipatory uh, contraction that we're seeing has been found to always precede the impact of the ball by the same amount of time, regardless of the height that the ball's dropped from. This uh, bit, bit of evidence demonstrates that catchers use knowledge of how a ball is being accelerated by gravity to time their muscle contractions accurately. So, in sum, we've got a mechanism here such that previous experience, and, or memory to use a conventional term, is used to predict the consequences of the sensory information that's being detected. Now let's talk about feedback or reactive control. Here we see that the ball has just contacted the hand. Remember, the specific task here is to catch the ball while keeping, the, keeping your arm in its initial posture. This initial posture is referred to as the desired state in the language of control theory, and is shown here with the dashed line. We see that the impact of the ball has caused this person's arm to extend out of and away from this desired posture. As with feed forward control, we're going to walk through a simple model of the feedback control process. We have our desired state of keeping the hand being level. 
Given this intention, the feedback, uh, the feedback control process is going to start off with a command that sets that desired state. This command is going to be sent to something that's called a compar comparator. The, compar the comparator is going to be a key part of this mechanism. We will come back to the comparator to understand its function in a moment. Before we come back to the comparator, we need to look at the sensor. We've got a muscle spindle here, which is going to be our sensor. It's going to prov pro uh, provide proprioceptive information about the disturbance. As before, we're going to, uh, we're going to process this sensory information. The input to the system uh, that we're going to get from our sensor is going to create a feedback signal. It's going to give us feedback about the state of the limb. So, returning to the com comparator, we can now see that the comparator has two inputs. The first input is the command that sets uh, the, uh, the posture that we want the body to be in, and the second input is the feedback signal that tells the compar comparator what the actual post posture of the body is. The comparator simply compares these two inputs, and an error signal is created based upon this comparison. The error sig signal can be fed into our, contr uh, into, into our controller, and that can be fed into uh, our muscle to create a correction to the uh, to create a correction to the movement. We can say we can summarize this sch schematic with a few easy steps. To start off with, we have an input from uh, from a sensory system that's being compared to a reference signal. The reference signal represents a desired state, which here is the particular position of the arm that we want to maintain. The difference between the sensory input and the reference signal, or error signal as it's termed in this model here, is used to update the output of the system. On this slide and the next, we'll be looking at distinct phases that exist in the task of reaching and grasping an object. In this slide, we'll be looking at locating and orienting. On the next slide, we'll be looking at reaching and grasping. The task of visually orienting requires coordinating the movements of the eyes, the head, and the trunk. To get a feel for this, let's look at the simple action of eating some cereal. This action is initiated by visually locating the bowl of cereal in front of you and visually locating the handle of the spoon that you're going to be used, using to feed yourself. In this initial orienting process, we have the direction, we have the direction that our eyes are looking in, which we call gaze direction. And we also have head direction and body facing direction. If the bowl of cereal is positioned directly in front of you, that is appearing in the center of your visual field, or if it's positioned just a little bit off to one side, then the process of orienting, to, uh, uh, of orienting yourself to the bowl will only involve, uh, involve eye movements. If alternatively the bowl of cereal is located off to one side, that is in your peripheral vision, as it is, as, uh, as it is in, the, in the figure shown here, we're going to see head and eye movements. Uh, um, uh, being combined. If it's located even further off to the side, we'll also get trunk movements involved in the orienting process. The task shown in the figure is orienting to the to-be-grasped object located in the peripheral visual field. In the case of this particular task, what we see is eye movement first, followed by head movement, and then followed by trunk movement. Just like the proximal to distal or distal to proximal muscle recruitment patterns we saw in our studies of posture and mobility, there's a specific order to the motion. Eyes first, then head, then trunk. At the end of the movement, the eyes have typically moved so as to be aimed directly at the target. In contrast to the eyes that move all the way to the target, the head typically only moves 65%, 65 to 75% of the distance to the target. And the, the torso is going to move an even smaller amount. We've just looked at the orienting phase. Now let's, let's look at the reach and grasp phases of the movement. <laughs> 
we visually located the target to be grasped, and now we're talking about the phase of actually reaching out and grasping it. To understand this phase, let's consider two different versions of this task. The first task variant is to reach out and grasp the object. The second task variant is to reach out and hit the object with your index finger in the particular example that we're going to be talking about. Task 1 is full reaching and grasping, and task 2 is effectively just a reach. Here we see the movement of the hand associated with these two different tasks. On the y-axis we have the velocity of the hand movement, and on the x-axis we have normalized time. Let's start by focusing on the grey lines. These show the velocity profiles for multiple attempts at reaching and grasping an object. Here we can see that the velocity of the hand is, uh, is initially increasing and accelerating, and it's then getting to a peak, after which it then slows down as, the, uh, 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 as you approach the, the point of grasping. In contrast, the red lines show multiple attempts for the task of pointing toward and hitting a target object. In this task, we see an increase in the velocity of the movement, and then the finger hitting the object when it's moving at its maximum velocity. In task 1, reaching and, uh, the reaching and grasping task, we see a slowing down, because this particular task requires precision. In contrast, in task 2, the precision requirements are minimal. All you need to do in this task is hit the target. It doesn't matter what velocity your hand is moving at when, you're, when your hand reaches the target. In task 1, we've got a deceleration phase, which is actually longer than the acceleration phase. We also have a longer movement duration than we do in task 2, because the hand needs to move, it needs to move in a slower, more controlled way in task 1. So, what are we seeing here? The movement that is produced in the reaching phase in both of these tasks is heavily influenced by what's going to happen at the end of the movement. The specifics of the task is shaping the, the, uh, the, uh, this particular phase of movement. Earlier we mentioned coordination of different phases of movements, and, th and that's exactly what we're seeing here. What happens in the final phase of movement here is going to shape the characteristics of the movement in its current phase. In the next part of this lecture, we're going to be looking at the neural systems that support reaching and grasping. The ability to perform an effective reach and grasp is supported by sensory systems, by the motor cortex, by the premotor cortex, by the posterior parietal lobe, and the cerebellum. Over the next few slides, we'll be looking at each of these in more detail. We'll start by looking at the roles of the sensory systems. And we'll start by thinking about the contribution of the visual system. When we were looking at postural control and mobility, we saw that it was the somatosensory system that played the most indispensable role. In the case of reaching and grasping, vision is, indisp is in in indispensable. The sensory inputs from the visual system go through two parallel pathways in the central nervous system. It's important for you to wrap your head around the nature of these two pathways. The two pathways are the dorsal stream and the ventral stream. These two pathways have very distinct functions. The dorsal stream processes information related to where an object is located in space, and the actions involved in interacting with those objects. The dorsal stream is also involved in the perceiving of affordances. The perceiving of affordances refers to the ability to visually perceive the environment as it relates to the control of action. This is a key function of the dorsal stream. The ventral stream, in contrast, is in the business of processing information about what's being reached for. This pr processing pathway is focused on object recognition. Over the next few slides, we'll explore these pathways functions in more detail. So let's look at these pathways. Here we have schematized the pathways taken by the dorsal and ventral streams through the nervous system. We see that the dorsal stream is schematized at the top, and the ventral stream is schematized at the bottom. 
To understand each stream, it's most logical to start on the right-hand side of this figure, looking at the specific cell types behind the retina. Ganglion cells represent an early and basic form of visual system functional organization. Ganglion cells are the final output neurons of the, of the retina. Ganglion cells collect and transmit information about the visual world from other cells in the retina. The difference between M and P type ganglion cells is relatively subtle and not too important for our current purposes. As we move from right to left across this, uh, this figure, we see various parts of the visual nervous system being identified. As we, move, uh, as we move from right and left, from right to left, we're moving through the successive levels of processing of visual information. Note that in the dorsal system, we end up in the parietal lobe, whereas in the ventral system, we end up in the temporal lobe. This will have some significance later. A simple way to understand the function of the dorsal system is that it supports perception for action's sake. Its function is to support guiding movements of the body through space and for detecting information about the structure and orientation of objects. The dorsal stream supports the function of being able to perceive an outstretched hand as something that you could shake, or as a chair as something that you could sit in. A simple way to understand the function of the ventral system is that it supports perception for perception's sake. Rather than being related to the actions that can be performed on objects, it's involved in detecting information about the identity and properties of the objects themselves. For example, your ability to recognize a face as a face, a hand as a hand, or a chair as a chair. So here we're talking about the perception of object characteristics, things like color and form. The function of the ventral, uh, uh, ventral system is believed to be related to conscious visual perceptual experience. That is, to our ability to look around and to be consciously aware of the properties of the world around us. In contrast, much of the visual detection of action relevant properties, like perceiving surfaces around us that could be, uh, like, like perceiving surfaces around us that could be walked on or sat down upon, is done largely unconsciously. Typically, we don't uh, walk around the world and think, oh, I could walk on that. You just do. Let's focus in on the dorsal stream. The dorsal, dorsal stream supports my ability to perceive a chair as a surface that will support sitting on for me. It involves perception for the sake of action. Some of the primary evidence for the functions of the dorsal and ventral pathways are derived from studies of patients with particular neuro neurological deficits. As we saw in the previous slide, the dorsal stream pathway involves the parietal lobe. Consequently, the functional impairments of patients with optic ataxia due to lesions in the parietal areas have been used to make inferences about the function of the dorsal stream. Patients with lesions in parietal areas have problems with positioning their fingers, adjusting the orientation of their hand when reaching, and reaching in the right direction. They are not able to organize visual information that's relevant for shaping and executing the actions that they perform. Now let's look at the ventral system. The ventral system supports my ability to perceive a chair-shaped object as a chair. Here we see a chair. My ability to see this tiny object as a chair, rather than as an object that cannot be sat upon and that can be grasped, involves the ventral stream. The ventral stream supports my ability to recognize the visual form of this object as a chair. When we have patients with ventral stream lesions, what do we see? Patients with ventral stream lesions have been found to have impairments in the ability to identify and name the objects that they're looking at. These participants are unable to name the object that they have, are unable to name the object that they're looking at, and they're able, uh, unable to consciously come in contact and to, to identify the properties of these objects. For example, patients with ventral stream lesions have frequently been found to have impaired conscious perception of the orientation or dimension of, of a particular object. <laughs> 
What's surprising with these patients is even though they're not consciously aware of the identity, orientation, or dimension of an object, they can reach for and pick up the objects that they're looking at with great adeptness. Thus, unlike patients with, with dorsal stream lesions, these patients have no problems with reaching in the right direction and positioning their fingers or adjusting the orientation of their hand when reaching towards an object. Let's look at the experimental evidence for there being two processing pathways. We're going to look at an experiment by Haffenden and Goodale. Haffenden and Goodale used the Ebbinghaus solution to test the theory that two visual pathways are implicated in reaching and grasping in healthy adults. Here we see the Ebbinghaus illusion. Look at the two orange circles. I want you to uh, look backwards and forwards between these two orange circles and think about which of these circles seems like it's larger. People tend to consciously perceive the, the circle on the left to be larger. This is called an illusion because these two circles are in fact the same size. The idea behind this research is that conscious experience of one dot looking smaller than the other is a ventral stream process. In other words, the researchers are hypothesizing that perceiving the size of the circle is a ventral stream process and that this particular process will be biased by the illusion. Haffenden and Goodale are proposing that object perception, which is a ventral stream process, is what's going to be biased by the illusion. They propose that if there are in fact two distinct processing pathways, if there's both a dorsal and a ventral stream process, then we might expect the illusion to impact the ventral pathway, but not the dorsal pathway. And we'll see this in the design of the experiment on the, ne on the next slide. The null hypothesis in this research is that there's not a meaningful distinction between dorsal and ventral pathways. The null hypothesis is that there's only one visual pathway that supports both perception of an object's properties and the controlling of actions such as, gra uh, such as grasping an object. If this is the case, then we would expect that both object perception and object directed actions would be equally affected by the illusion. And this is what we're going to test on the next slide. So let's look at the experiment that was performed. We'll be looking at experiment two from this particular research paper. Participants were asked to perform two tasks. The first task that participants performed was reaching for one of the center disks. This is going to be an action process. Notice that unlike the picture that was used on the previous slide, here we're using thin disks that can actually be physically picked up. The second task is to estimate the size of one of the center disks. This is going to be a perceptual process. For this particular task, participants are asked to consciously estimate the width of the disks by adjusting the distance between their thumb and forefinger to have a matching distance. Task one is hypothesized to be a dorsal stream process, and task two is hypothesized to be a ventral stream process. Now, there's a slightly confusing detail in this research, so you're going to need to pay attention to it to fully understand what's going on here. In this experiment, we have two, centra, two central disks in both task 1 and task 2. We've labelled them here A and B. The confusing detail in this research is that the centre disk labelled A on the left is going to be made a little bit narrower than centre disk B. The disk on the left uh, labelled A is going to be made 2.4 millimetres narrower than the centre disc labelled B. Since people normally perceive the size of this disc to be slightly larger, this change made it so that people consciously perceived the discs to be the same size. So the, ch the size change of the disc is designed to try and offset the, uh, the effect of the, the illusion. We'll see the reason for this on the next slide. Let's look at the results of this experiment. To recap, center disk A is actually 2.44 millimeters narrower than center disk B. So let's have a look at how people, how people react to these targets. 
let's start by looking at the result for performances of actually reaching for the disk, a hy hypothesized to be dorsal stream process. So remembering that center disk A is actually, is actually narrower than B, what do we end up seeing? As we would expect, the maximum grip aperture is narrower when reaching for the narrower disk. The maximum grip aperture refers to the maximum width between the fingers during the grasping motion. In simple terms, what we're seeing here is that grip is adjusted to the actual size of the center disks. Now let's look at the findings for task two, for the task of, uh, of estimating the size of the disk by moving your, finger, uh, moving your fingers apart to, a, to be a matching distance. This is hypothesized to be a ventral stream process. In this task, you look at the disk and then you move your fingers apart until it looks like the distance between your thumb and your full finger is visually the same as the distance between the two sides of the disk. Remember, the illusion makes it seem like that we have two disks that, that are actually different sized. It makes it look like they're actually the same size. Consistent with this hypothesis that visual size estimation should be affected by the illusion, we see that participants estimated the sizes of the two disks to be the same. In sum, what we're seeing here is completely different effects for these two types of tasks. One type of task is not affected by the illusion, and the other, the other task is affected by the illusion. If we take this evidence, together with multiple, with multiple other sources of evidence in the literature, we end up with some quite compelling evidence that there's actually two separate pathways of processing in the visual nervous system. Let's move on from vision to talking about the somatosensory system, and the role of the somatosensory system in upper extremity movements. A basic finding in the literature is that humans with severe peripheral sen sensory neuropathy struggle with complex movements. However, they can effectively perform simple movements with, when they have vision available. I've got an interesting case study to share with you on this topic by Rothwell, uh, Rothwell et al. The case study concerns patient GO. GO has impaired somatosens uh, somatosensation. In this figure, the shaded in areas show where GO is absent vibration sense. In this next figure, we've shaded the regions where GO is absent light touch sense. And in this third image, we've shaded the region, regions where GO has reduced pinprick appreciation. In sum, these, these images illustrate the quite severe peripheral neuropathy affecting GO. Patients with these types of somatic sensory deficits experience great difficulties with compl complex functional behaviours, and, uh, and they experience great difficulties in completing basic activities of daily living, such as eating, drinking, and dressing. Geo is unable to lift and grasp a mug only using one hand. The Geo always uses two hands. Geo is unable to hold a pen between their thumb and, and uh, their thumb and fingers, and unsurprisingly, given this, Geo's handwriting is almost illegible. Geo is unable to pick up small objects, for example, a nickel, and Geo is unable to haptically perceive of objects that are placed into their hands. In sum, what we're seeing here is that complex manual behaviours are severely impaired. Let's look at some more details of the case of Geo. We just mentioned that Geo's ability to perform complex movements is significantly impaired. But what about simple movements? To understand this, let's look at Geo's ability to repetitively perform sequential thumb finger opposition. So here's the simple task. First, bring your thumb and your index finger together. Then bring your thumb and middle finger together. Then bring your thumb and ring finger together. And then bring your thumb and li little finger together. And then repeat this pattern. The task then is to sequentially bring the thumb together with each finger in turn. When Geo performs this relatively simple movement task with their eyes open, 
the task is performed pretty reliably and effectively. In contrast, if Geo has their eyes closed, task performance becomes significantly impaired. So here we have a picture of Geo's initial performance. Shortly after Geo closes their eyes, we see Geo is able to perform thumb finger oppositions effectively, and he's able to perform the, the, pro the finger progression pretty well. But over time, after about, 30, after about 30 seconds, these oppositions have completely deteriorated. The picture here is taken just 30 seconds after starting to perform this task. You can see that there's a complete missing of contact and that there's no awareness in this patient that that's happening. You may well very well, you may very well be reminded of the case of Ian Waterman. What we're seeing here bears striking similarities to the impairments that Ian experiences. In sum, for this patient, without either visual or somatosensory feedback, there's considerable movement drift in manual movements. Let's look at another type of somatosensory contribution to upper extremity movement. Muscle spindles are involved in both arm and hand position sense. Evidence for this comes from muscle vibration studies. If you vibrate the tendons of a muscle, then the muscle spindle 1A afferents are going to be mechanically activated. In simple terms, the method is something akin to holding an electric toothbrush up to the tendon. The vibration stimulates a stretch of the tendon. What happens then is that this vibration causes the illusion of a stretch of the, te the tendon. When a tendon is vibrated, the subject gets the illusion that the joint is moving in the direction that would be consistent with that particular tendon being stretched. In the picture we see here, we see a device that applies tendon vibration to the hand. When the vibrations are applied at precise locations on the finger flexor tendons, they create illusions of extension movements. Here we see the same principle being applied to creating an illusory wrist flexion. The right-hand side image illustrates the degree of illusory flexion that can be created with this kind of stimulation. Let's now look at somatosensory contributions to grasping. Cutaneous afferent input is essential for the control of grip forces. Cutaneous afferents can detect slipping and activate pathways that increase activity in finger muscles so as to increase grip force. In a research study by Monze et al, it was found that mechanoreceptors in the fingertips can, can, can signal both the magnitude and direction of pressure applied to the, the, applied to the skin. This means that in the case of keeping hold of a slippery bar of soap that we see in the picture here, fingertip mechanoreceptors can actually give you information about how the, the, how the soap is moving relative to your hand. To understand more about the somatosensory contributions to grasp, let's look at a study by Whitney et al. Whitney et al. anaesthetized participants' fingers to prevent cutaneous feedback. The effect is similar to the experience of losing sensation in your fingers on a really cold day. In this experiment, your task is to rhythmically move a ball that you're holding up and down. In order not to drop the ball, you have to regulate the grip forces that you're applying. That is, you need to regulate how firmly you're pinching the ball. Importantly, the grip force that you need to apply depends upon the load force. And the load force depends in turn upon the force due to gravity acting on the ball, as well as the inertial forces generated by accelerating the ball up and down through the rhythmic motions required for the task. In simple terms, if you have a heavier object, you need a tighter grip. Uh, and if you're moving the object faster, you will also need a tighter grip. So, in this task of rhythmically moving the ball up and down, the acceleration of the hand combined with the effects of gravity is going to change the load force that's created and the grip that's required. Now that we understand the basic physics of this task, let's look at how the task is performed by a healthy young adult. On the x-axis we have time, and on the y-axis we have force. At the bottom of the graph, we can see, uh, see load force rhythmically increasing and decreasing with the oscillatory movements of the hand. 
as the hands are as, as the hand is moving up and down the required load forces decrease and increase when you look at the grip forces that are produced by a healthy young adult with intact somata sensation you can see that the produced grip forces are constantly larger than the load force in order to keep the ball from dropping we also see that the grip force is being increased and decreased in coordination with the changer, the changing load force demands of the task. In sum, what we're seeing here is that grip forces are being modulated with the changing load force in order to prevent the object from slipping out of the hands. Okay, let's compare what we're seeing here to anaesthetized fingers. When we, people are doing the task when they've lost the cutaneous information. Here we see data for the task being performed by participants that have anaesthetized fingers. The first thing that you'll notice is that the applied grip force is increased significantly. The strategy here appears to be that if you can't accurately sense your grip on the ball, then you should just grip it more tightly. A, strat a strategy of gripping objects more firmly than is needed is something that we quite often see with older adults. So, here we're seeing subjects using a strategy of increasing grip forces to compensate for the lack of somatosensory information. Something else to note, note here is that the coordination between grip and load forces is actually deteriorating. Let's look at another study that investigates the somatosensory contributions to GRASP. In this study, the first task that experiments had participants perform was to hold an object still for 20 seconds using a pinch grip. The picture here shows the object that participants tried to hold in place. The task here is to pinch the, is to pinch the object just tight and tight enough for it to not start slipping out of your hand. Before we start looking at the average performances that we see in this experiment, let's try to understand the data from one subject. Here we, uh, here we have normal grip where fingers are not anaesthetized. On the x-axis we can see that we're looking at data for 20 seconds of holding the object. And we can see that the grip force is pretty constant. Now let's look at data from the same participant after their fingers have been anaesthetized. At the beginning of the trial, we see the participant is dramatically ramping up the grip force that they're applying to the object, and we're seeing that the elevated grip force is being used throughout the entire trial. We're also seeing a large increase in the variability of the data. Of the data. We're seeing large amounts of variation in terms of the magnitude of grip that people are using. Okay, so this is just data from one subject. Let's look at the average data for all of the, the research subjects in this study. In this graph, notice that we have switched our y-axis variable from looking at the magnitude of grip and load forces to now looking at the ratio of grip force to load force. You should also notice the red horizontal line. This line shows the critical ratio between grip force and load, load force, below which the object will start slipping through the hands. When the fingers are not anaesthetized, what do we end up seeing? At the start of the trial, at zero seconds, we're seeing participants being comfortably above the critical ratio, but at the same time not being too far above it. By the end of the trial, we see that the the the, uh, the ratio of grip force to load uh, to, uh, of grip force to load force has decreased over time, while still staying safely above the critical value. In contrast, with fingers anaesthetized, we see much larger values of grip force divided by load force. What's going on here is that participants have created a very large safety margin. As with the non-anaesthetized group, we see a decrease in the ratio of grip force to load force over, uh, uh, over time, as participants slowly get a feel of the forces that can be used, uh, the, um, the grip forces that can be used without the object slipping. By, uh, uh, by getting closer to the critical ratio in, at the end of the trial, we've again reduced the safety margin. So this is the data for task one of the study. Let's now move and look at the second task that was performed by participants in this study.
Whereas participants in the first task just held the object, the second task requires participants to oscillate the object up and down for 30 seconds. As before, let's look at data from just one subject. Here we're looking at the data for one subject with anaesthetized fingers. On this graph, we can see grip force, load force, and the ratio of the two forces, all plotted over time for 30 seconds. Again, the critical ratio is shown as a red line. When you dip below this red line, a slip is going to occur. You will notice that we have a moment in this trial where a slip does actually occur. This moment is highlighted with the vertical purple line that I've just revealed here. What we're seeing here is that this subject has not created a large enough safety margin to avoid a slip occurring. You will notice that after the slip has occurred, that we see an increase in that safety margin. So in this particular trial, the object begins to slip and the subject manages to increase grip force in order to avoid it falling out of their hands. After this event, the subject then ramps up their grip force and increases their safety margin. We've just been looking at the data from one subject. What kinds of patterns of results do we see for all of the subjects? In this task, the, the, <coughs> excuse me, the researchers found that when the participants' fingers were anaesthetized, that is, when, uh, when they did not have cutaneous information about their grip, that seven out of 10 subjects dropped the object at least once during the 30 second period. Over the past few slides, in order to understand the somatosensory contributions to GRASP, we've been looking at the particular contributions of the peripheral nervous system. Now, let's look at some more central contributions. In this picture of the brain, we've highlighted the primary somatosensory area. In this area, we observe neural activity relating to specific body parts. As you'll probably have seen before, the primary somatosensory area pre pre uh, possesses a topographically organized representation of different body segments. This topographic organization is illustrated with images of body segments that are associated with the different regions. As we know from early research by Wilder, Wilder, uh, Wilder Penfield, if you were to try and stimulate these particular areas of the cortex, you'll create a sense that that part of the, your, your body is being touched. With this basic refresher in hand, let's look at some research that explores the role of the primary somatosensory area in grasping. Here we have a study performed on macaque monkeys. In this study, the researchers used a chemical procedure to cause inactivation of the finger area of the primary somatosensory area. This inactivation led to uncoordinated grip and load forces. Salimi et al. performed a different study with macaque monkeys. In this study, single cell recordings were taken of the finger area of the primary somatosensory area. The single cell recording technique revealed distinct types of cells. By probing different cells in, the re in, the, in, uh, in this region of the cortex, the researchers discovered rapidly adapting cells and slowly adapting cells. The rapidly adapting cells showed brief increases in activity at grip onset. In contrast, the slowly adapting cells showed sustained activity during stationary holding. The authors found that both of these cell types responded vigorously to shear force perturbations and contact slips on the fingers. The researchers also found a number of cells that showed increased activity shortly before the grip occurred. This is quite interesting. It suggests that there's cells that receive input from both peripheral cutaneous inputs as well as movement-related regions in the brain. In sum, this research demonstrates that we have cells in the central nervous system that are responding to functional the functional dimensions of the task of grasp, grasping and holding an object. So let's do a gross summary of the neurophysiology supporting reaching and grasping. The plan here is to try and put together a basic overview understanding of how reaching and grasping is supported by relevant neurophysiology. Let's do a quick recap. We have two visual pathways of visual processing. 
We have a ventral stream pathway, which projects, informa informa projects information supporting conscious perception of object identity and object properties into the temporal cortex. And we have a dorsal stream, which is projecting action-relevant information into the parietal cortex. The parietal cortex is involved in mediating sensory motor transformations for visually guided actions that are directed to objects. We're going to be talking about sensory motor transformations quite a bit. We reviewed the two visual, visual streams on the previous slide, because that's going to be our entry point into putting together our gross summary of the neurophysiology supporting reaching and grasping. The parietal cortex is going, to be, is going to receive inputs via the dorsal stream. A key function of the parietal cortex is going to involve organizing action-relevant information. This is going to include organizing proprioceptive information, such as joint-joint relationships, it's going to include organizing expropriaceptive information concerning the relationship between the body and the surrounding environment. And it's also going to, in, uh, going to include organizing extraceptive information that concerns the action relevant information about events occurring out in the world. The parietal cortex is going to send information to higher centers, to the parietal lobes and premotor areas. Neurophysiological studies have implicated these higher, center, higher centers in, the high, uh, in, in, in high levels of action planning and action organization. This includes the ch includes challenges such as identifying targets in space, action selection, forming a movement plan, and organizing the sequencing of movements. In essence, these higher centers are involved in some of the highest levels of action planning. This movement plan is going to be fed into the motor cortex. The motor cortex is going to take that movement plan and is going to turn it into a movement output that is then relayed to the brainstem and the, and the spinal cord. The higher centers which are involved in choosing the course of action also send a copy of that movement plan to the cerebellum. In the scientific literature, this copy is referred to as a corollary discharge or efferent's copy. The important thing is, in, in terms of understanding this, is that we're sending a copy of the movement plan to the cerebellum. The cerebellum also receives input from the brainstem and the spinal cord. It's ref it's ref it receives what's referred to as reafferents. In other words, it receives information from the senses about the result of the movement. We see that the motor cortex is involved in producing the movement. The movement that is produced generates afferent information that contains information about how the movement actually plays out. This, is, this information is what we're calling reafferents. I'm sure you can see where we're going with this. We're talking about feed forward and feedback processes here. The cerebellum here is acting as a comparator. It is evaluating the sensory consequences of the reach, and it's comparing that to the expectations set by the movement plan organized by the higher centers. The cerebellum takes in these inputs, and it compares what was intended relative to what's happened. It then sends error correction information that can be used to refine the movement output to the motor cortex. We're going to spend the next few slides learning about sensory motor transformations. The starting point for understanding the concept of sensory motor transformations is the realization that multiple reference frames exist for the perceptual measurements that are relevant for controlling actions. In the case of visual information, visual information is often measured in eye-centered coordinates. So when we look across multiple different studies concerning the visual control of action and try to understand what uh, frame of reference visual information is going to be embedded, we're often going to find that that information is embedded in an eye-centered reference frame. Think back to the study we reviewed con concerning how to catch a fly ball. We saw that the optical motion on the retina was carrying information about whether or not you should run forwards or backwards in order to intercept the object. The motion on the retina and the sight of the ball moving up in the air was in an eye-centered coordinate frame. In the case of 
auditory information. Auditory information is often measured in head-centered coordinates. Lastly, somatosensory information is often measured in body-centered coordinates. These relationships between a particular perceptual system and the reference frames that are associated with them is not universal, but they are reasonably reliably observed. What we're seeing here is that different perceptual systems tend to have different kinds of coordinate systems, and they tend to have different types of measurement reference frames in the information that they detect. So what's the consequences of this? If we're going to have different perceptual systems making measurements in different coordinates, we're going to need some transformations in order to be able to take in this information and to be able to relate it to motor control. So we've got in, a, in an informational reference frame on one side and a control reference frame on the other on the other side. So what are control reference frames? Some examples of control reference frames include the activation of muscles, either individual muscles or muscle synergies, effector orientations, for example, a gaze direction or an arm direction, and we've got body environment relationships, such as a relationship between an end effector and a goal. As with the informational side, on the control side, we see multiple different ways of framing what's actually going on in the system. In sum, what we're seeing here is that there's multiple possible reference frames, or ways of describing both the perception of action-relevant information and the control of action. One of the fundamental challenges faced by the nervous system is organizing information and control into a coherent functional system such that action-relevant inf information can be mapped efficiently into an organization of action. We've been talking in very abstract terms here. Let's unpack a concrete example of the problem of sensory motor transformations. We're going to look at the sensory motor transformations that are associated with the simple task of visually guiding a reaching of the hand towards a doorknob. The task requires that the hand is moved from its current location to the location of the target. On this slide, we'll refer to the hand with the letter H and the doorknob with the letter T standing for target. So we have hand H and target T. We can understand the relationship between H and T by considering different reference frames. In the red in the figure, we can see an eye-centered reference frame that's being organized for, around vision. The visual system can get information about where the hand is relative to the doorknob in eye-centered coordinates. The somatosensory system is likely to be detecting information about where the hand is relative to the body. It's also likely to be detecting information about the, where the body is relative to the target. We can see these relationships being schematized with the gray lines. These lines are body-centered rather than eye-centered. So we ha what we have here is two very different ways of measuring the relationship between H and T. One that is used in the control of uh, the, uh, the action of moving the hand to the target, and one that's used in the visual detection of information about the relationship between the hand and the target. When we go, uh, when we go in and look at the activity, of the posterior parietal cortex, we see that the activity of different neurons in this cortex is associated with the measurement of the position of T and H in multiple different ways. From single cell recordings of the posterior parietal cortex, researchers have learned that firing patterns of some neurons are, are related to changes happening to T and H measured in eye-centered coordinates. They've learned that the firing patterns of other neurons are related to changes that are happening to T and H measured in limb-centered coordinates. And they've learned that the firing patterns of yet other neurons are related to changes that are, changes that are happening to T and H measured in both eye-centered coordinates and limb-centered coordinates. This last case is particularly interesting because these neurons are, eff are effectively being a mixture of these two different coordinate systems. These neurons there are, are therefore potentially special, 
because they have the potential to play a crucial role in transforming the measurements in eye-centered coordinates into measurements in body-centered coordinates. Here we have the different coordinate systems that are typically associated with the different perceptual systems. Given these different reference frames, a key function of the posterior parietal cortex is transforming each of these inputs into a common reference frame. One way to think about this is that the nervous system involves a lot of different languages, lots of different ways of talking about movement. The posterior parietal cortex is believed to play a key role in taking these different, sensory, different types of sensory inputs with their distinct languages and transforming them into a common language. In the case of visually guided reaching, researchers have proposed that this shared language is eye-centered coordinates. If, we have transform, if we've transformed all of these different sources of information into eye-centered coordinates, then what we have to do is further transform this information into limb-centered coordinates in order to control the, the reaching motion. What we, uh, when we talk about sensory motor transformations, we're considering the various reference frames that need to be manipulated and converted between in order to organize functional actions. We're also considering the question of what kinds of languages are spoken by the nervous system in the creation of functional movements. Consistent with the idea that a key function of the posterior parietal cortex is the ability to uh, perform transformations between different reference frames, different areas within the posterior parietal cortex have been implicated in different aspects of movement planning. So, for example, the lateral uh, the lateral intraparietal cortex has been implicated in saccade, uh, in saccade planning. For those of you that don't know, saccades are very quick eye movements. When you look from one place to another, you will make a very quick movement. The movement is ballistic, such that the eye flicks to the new orientation that you want to be looking at. The medial superior temporal area is specialized for planning smooth pursuit eye movements. Unlike saccadic movements, smooth pursuit eye movements involve smoothly tracking the movements of an, of an object in the environment. If I move my mouse cursor, cursor around the screen and ask you to follow it, you will be producing a smooth pursuit eye movement. Alternatively, if I ask you to look at the S at the beginning of this, this sentence and then go and look at the letter at the end of the sentence, your eye will flick over and uh, and, see, uh, and see the G. The quick motion of your eyes from the S to the G is a saccadic movement. The medial intraparietal area is implicated in the planning of reaching movements. And then lastly, in terms of lo us looking at different areas in the posterior parietal cortex, we have the anterior intraparietal area. And this area is implicated in planning a grasp. We spent much of today talking about the role of sensory systems in reaching and grasping. Let's briefly now talk about the types of motor organization involved in grasping an object. Grips can be classified as power grips or precision grips. When I was looking for images for this slide, I ended up finding images of cricket balls. And since I understand a lot more about the game of cricket than I do about the game of baseball, which would be the other most logical thing to use for, for this slide, we're going to stick with that. A power grip is defined by the fact that both finger and thumb pads are directed towards the palm. This grip transmits forces to the object. The fingers and the thumbs both are both pointing towards the palm and therefore are directing forces towards the palm. We can give different examples of a power grip. A hook grasp is formed when holding the handle of a suitcase. A cylindrical grasp is formed when holding a bottle. And a spherical grasp is formed when holding a softball. Now, in the case of a precision grip, Forces are directed between the thumb and the finger, rather than towards the palm. The precision grip allows movement of the object relative to the hand. It allows the object to be moved within the hand, 
The person shown here, holding the pencil, can move the pencil backwards and forwards relative to their hand. Similarly, this, per this person holding a cricket ball, with a precision grip, can manipulate the cricket ball in order to, in order to facilitate different styles of bowling. Similarly, I imagine that in baseball, there's certain pitches where the ability to manipulate the ball relative to the hand, as opposed to hold the ball firmly in the hand, which is what we'd see with the power grip, is going to facilitate different types of ball behavior in the pitches. To further understand the motor constraints on grasping, it's going to be useful to look at grasp kinematics. Over the course of a reach, we're going to see a shaping of the hand for grasping. Over the course of this transportation phase of the hand, we're going to see the grasp coming into existence and being adapted to the particular object that's going to be grasped. In the diagram here, we're seeing the grasp of a thin object. For a precision grip of the object, the grip aperture is going to be modified almost exclusively by finger motion. This is an interesting and peculiar, peculiar aspect of grip formation. The first time I learned about it, I actually went and looked at my own grasp to demonstrate to myself that this was actually the case. If you look at your own pre pre precision grasps, you'll see that your thumb stays relatively stationary throughout the motion. One interpretation of this is that the thumb is used by vision as a reference for where the hand is. So by virtue of keeping your thumb in the same position and adjusting your finger relative to your thumb, you end up with a more stable visual reference frame. As I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, the visual system is thought to make the most significant contribution to the control of manual abilities. Consistent with this, cl this claim, pre-grasp hand shaping appears to be heavily under visual control. One reason for the importance of vision is that manual, manual behaviours concern interacting with environmental objects, and vision, given that it's a distal sense, is going to be the sense that's going to be most, uh, most able to provide the relevant information. I would like to finish up today's lecture by talking about the role of postural control in supporting effective reaching and grasping. We've talked about anticipatory postural adjustments before, but it's useful to go through it again. So we're going to have the simple task of raising your arm. You start with your hands by your side, you then receive a go signal, followed by a particular response latency and then we'll see a voluntary response where you're actually raising up your arm. What we actually care about here is the distal to proximal ordering of muscle activations that lays the stable postural foundations for the stable performance of a reaching motion. In the figure here, we see the order of muscle activations. The more distal muscles are recruited first, laying the postural foundations, before shoulder extensor muscles are recruited. In general here, what we're seeing is that healthy anticipatory postural adjustments involve action-specific muscle recruitment and task-appropriate ordering of muscle activations. Anticipatory postural adjustments are supported by the, the cerebellum. The role of the cerebellum is suggested by the impact of cerebellar lesions on anticipatory postural adjustments. For individuals with cerebellar lesions, the anticipatory, the anticipatory postural adjustments that were well learned before the lesion occurred are likely to be largely intact, although they may have poor timing. Additionally, anticipatory postural adjustments that were well learned before the lesion occurred are not going to be able to be adapted. Lastly, Anticipatory postural adjustments for novel tasks, that is, tasks that were learned after the lesion, are not going to be able to be developed. In sum, for individuals with cerebellar lesions, significant challenges to balance are going to occur with everyday movements, and especially with any kind of new movement. In today's lecture, we, we introduced the topics of reach, grasp and manipulation. We covered the main sensory, neural, and motor constraints that are relevant to understanding reaching and grasping. We also covered the important issue of sensory motor transformations.